of you, if you'll be taking your Old Testament and be locating Psalm 78 this morning. Psalm 78, and we'll focus our attention there in a few moments together. I want to begin by expressing my appreciation for the invitation to come and be with you. It's a joy and privilege to be here today. And I hope that you'll be encouraged whenever we leave this building today. And based on our classes this morning, our worship the next hour, and then our worship this evening. This is a time when we can come together and we can worship and study God's Word, but also we can gain the benefits, can't we? We can be encouraged, we can be challenged, we can be built up. We can be provoked to love and good work, stirred up to serve God as we leave this building. So that's my prayer as we leave this place today, that we'll be built up, that we'll be encouraged, and be on fire to serve the Lord as we begin our work week then tomorrow. Notice with me this morning for our class, Psalm 78. And as you're turning there, I want to ask you a question. Is your home a classroom? Is your home a classroom? We realize that for those of us who have children, we have a great responsibility. For some 18 years, that child is our responsibility. We're to make sure all of their needs are met. We're to make sure they have food, they have clothing, they have shelter. Make sure they have education, they have health care. They have all the things they need in this life to survive and thrive and make it. That's our responsibility. For some 18 years, all of those things are laid upon our shoulders. And in many respects, we do well at that. We make sure our children have food. We make sure our children have clothing, have toys, have all kind of technology. We make sure they go to school and make good grades. Make sure they excel in recreation and all sorts of things like that. But how much more important is it for us as parents and even as grandparents to make sure our children are growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? And that's our responsibility. It's not the church's responsibility, though the church can assist and help in a great way towards that end. We're not doubting that. It's not the school system's responsibility, is it? They're not going to do that. But it's our responsibility as parents and as grandparents to make sure our children are learning God's Word, maturing in their knowledge of God's Word, and one day, because of what they know and what they've now applied, can be prepared to meet the Lord in judgment. Our home has to be a classroom. But not just a classroom to provide physical needs and even recreational needs, and secular needs, but it's a classroom where we teach and instill God's Word to the next generation. And that's exactly what Asaph is writing about here in Psalm 78. Here in Psalm 78, you notice the heading of this psalm. It is a psalm of Asaph. Asaph is writing this passage by inspiration of God, of course, and he's writing what's called a didactic psalm or a psalm of teaching or instruction. And so Asaph, by inspiration of God, is writing this passage to teach Israel, to instruct Israel concerning some very important spiritual truths. Now you notice in this psalm, it's a very long psalm. In fact, it's 72 verses of Scripture. And beginning in verse 9 down through verse 72... Asaph begins to do something very unique. He begins to reach back to Israel's history and quote from various events, various happenings in their past. And it's a repetitious flow like this. God blessed Israel, but Israel rebelled. God blessed Israel, but Israel rebelled. Over and over and over. Now notice with me, beginning in Psalm 78 verse 1, how Asaph begins this psalm. He's going to be teaching and instructing Israel concerning these difficult lessons of the past. But notice what he says beginning in verse 1. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings 
from of old. Things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children, to teach the next generation, that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God but keep his commandments. That they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation. A generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. Asa says, verse 2, I'm going to be telling you some things in a parable. I'm going to be making some analogies for you. And as I make these analogies, as I speak these things, it's going to be dark sayings of old. Beginning of verse 9 to verse 72, Asaph goes back to Israel's history and reminds them of some dark things. Some things they might not want to think about. That God over and over again has been blessing them, literally showering the blessings on them. Yet over and over and over they've not responded to God's love, responded to God's grace, responded to God's kindness. They, as verse 8 says, have been a stubborn generation, a rebellious generation. That's the analogies. That's the stories. That's the dark sayings of old. But notice what Asaph says. He says, brethren, I'm telling you these things, these things you might not want to think about anymore, but you need to think about them. I'm telling you these things so that you can take God's word and commit God's word to your children, your grandchildren, and all the coming generations. So I ask you, is your home doing that? Is your home taking the word of God, the mighty works and wonders of God, and committing those things to the next generation? That your children and then even your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren may know them and do them. That's the thrust of Psalm 78. Now in this passage, I believe we can focus our attention on the first eight verses this morning. And from those first opening eight verses, based on the purpose of Asaph in this passage, to tell Israel to teach their children... I think we can draw three basic points this morning for our application that will help us wherever we are as a young couple or even as maybe a great grandparent, wherever we are to make sure we're helping our home, our family unit, be a classroom for children. Notice first of all with me this morning that we have in verses 1 to 3, we have the preparation for teaching. If my home and your home is to be a classroom for children, a place wherein God's word is taught, learned, and obeyed, then we have to prepare ourselves for that. Notice beginning in verse 1, down through verse 3, what Asaph says. Before he gives this call to teach your children, before he brings up these difficult things of the past, that they're to teach their children, notice what he first tells Israel. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. What words? I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. Asaph says, I'm about to tell you some things, brethren remind you of some very important spiritual lessons you already know, but I want you to pay careful and close attention to what I'm going to tell you. If you circle things in your Bible or highlight words in your Bible, then notice in verse 1 that Asaph says the same thing in two different ways. In verse 1, Asaph says to give ear, doesn't he? Then he says also... They're not just to give ear to what he's about to teach. 
But they're to incline their ears to what he's going to teach. When you look at those two phrases there in the Hebrew language, Asaph is telling them, I want you to pay careful and close attention to what I'm going to tell you. Have you ever told your child something and you ask them, are you listening to me? They might hear the words, but they're not really listening to you, are they? Ace is saying, I don't want you just to hear the words. I want you to actually listen to these things. I want you to incline your ear, give your ear to what I'm going to tell you. It's the idea of someone stooping over and stretching out their ear. Maybe cupping the hand behind the ear. So as to amplify the sound and make sure they hear every word. To make sure they know and understand. That's what Asaph is saying. In order for you to teach your children these things. You need to listen carefully and give careful close attention to these things yourself. Isn't that where it all begins brethren? If we're going to make sure our home is a classroom for children, how can we do that unless we, the person in the mirror, is giving careful, close attention to what God says? We have to open up our ears, incline our ears, bend our ears, stretch out the ears, cup the hand behind the ear to hear the voice of God so we can know, understand, and obey. Hold your marker here for a moment in Psalm 78 and go back with me several books in our Old Testament to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 6. And I want you to notice in Deuteronomy chapter 6 as Moses was telling Israel something similar to what Asaph is telling Israel now to teach your children God's word, to commit the ways of God to the next generation. I want you to notice what Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter 6. I want to begin reading in verse 1 this morning. Moses said in his last sermon to Israel, Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules, that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. So Moses is saying, I'm going to teach you some things, some things you need to think about and consider. What are these things? Teach you that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, that your days may be long. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, that you may be multiplied greatly, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised." You a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Notice verse 6. Notice the emphasis in verses 1 to 5. Hear, 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 listen, listen, listen. You obey, you obey, you do this, you do this. Notice verse 6. And these words which I command you today shall be on your heart. Then what's he say beginning of verse 7? Then you teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on your doorpost and on your house and your gates. God's words to permeate their life. It's to be committed, entrusted to the next generation. But that can't happen unless we ourselves are hearing God Listening to God, giving careful, close attention to God, obeying God. We can't make sure God's word is in their heart until God's word is first in our heart. That's the preparation of teaching that Asaph is talking about in Psalm 78. Asaph is saying, I want you to take these lessons of history and make sure the next generation knows them so they can obey God 
But first of all, you have to give your own mind, your own attention to God's word. Whenever we think about our responsibility to teach our children and make sure our children grow up to be what God would have them to be, how can we expect them to be something that we are not? How can we expect them to grow up and know something that we don't know? How can we expect them to grow up and be someone who prizes knowing the scriptures and understanding God's word if we ourselves don't prize knowing the scriptures and understanding God's word? How can we hope that our kids will one day grow up, that they will be active, faithful members of the Lord's church if we ourselves aren't active, faithful members of the Lord's church? How can we expect our children to one day grow up and be exemplary in attending worship services and attending Bible classes and attending outside activities beyond those basic worship services? How can we expect that of them if we ourselves aren't doing that? How can we hope and pray that one day our child might grow up and be a very effective soul winner if we ourselves aren't doing that? You see, it all begins right there with us, doesn't it? If our home is to be what God wants it to be, and the next generation to be what God wants it to be, it begins with us. Asaph did not begin with teaching that next generation. He began with that first generation hearing and obeying God's word. That's the preparation for teaching. Notice then number two with me from this passage back in Psalm 78 that as we continue breaking down these first eight verses we not only see the preparation of teaching that is me as the first generation giving careful close heed to God's word but then secondly we find the practice of teaching. The practice of teaching. Notice in verses four and five. Having now decided to give ear to God's word ourselves, to focus on God's word ourselves, Asaph says, these things you've heard and known, verse 3, verse 4, we will not hide them from their children, but tell the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children. Now again, we notice some words in verses 4 and 5 regarding this practice of teaching, don't we? Notice in verse 4, negatively, he couches this as the idea of not hiding God's word from your children. The positive would be teach your children. The negative, the way it's couched first, is don't hide these things from your children. So there's one way it's stressed. Then he says this in verse 4, tell the coming generation. A second way teaching is emphasized. Don't hide these things. That's the first way. Number two, tell these things. Then we see in verse 5, teach their children. So three times in two verses, Asaph says, now that you have your ears open to God's word, now that you understand these things, Don't hide these things from your children. Tell them to your children. Teach your children. That's the practice of teaching. But I want you to notice two things from these two verses about this practice of teaching that I think are very important things that we need to consider. First of all, there is deliberateness when it comes to teaching. Deliberateness. I want you to notice again verse 4. He uses a negative and a positive to teach Israel to teach their children. But I want you to notice what he says. These things, the things of God, he says we're not going to hide them from our children, but we're going to teach them to our children. How would one hide something from your children? How would one possibly hide God's word 
from their children. Well, flip the coin as he finishes that statement. We're not going to hide them. We're going to teach them. My friends, the way a parent makes a decision not to hide or conceal God's word from their children is by making that deliberate decision to teach God's word to their children. That's how. The way you choose not to hide God's word is to teach God's word. That's what Asaph is saying. You know these things. They don't hide these things from them. Tell them. So imagine that. That in your home, if you're not actively, deliberately striving to commit God's word to the next generation, God says you're actually hiding God's word from the next generation. You're actually covering it up and concealing it. You're making it hidden to the next generation. I don't know about you, but I think about my child Morgan and, and the great blessing of, of having a child, having a soul. And being responsible for that soul. And I shudder at the thought of one day being before God in judgment. And God saying, why did you hide my word from your child? Why did you, why did you not teach him my word? After all, you were a minister of God's word. You had all this time for yourself to study the Bible, to teach my people. But yet you did not teach your child. Why did you hide, in the words of Asaph, why did you hide God's word from your child? My friends, if we're not teaching our children, that's deliberateness, then what we're doing is we're hiding God's word from them. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be in that position before God. I don't want to stand before God one day, having had the time, the opportunity, the commission to teach my children, and yet I did not do that deliberately and therefore actually covered up God's word from them. So there's that point about this practice of teaching. It's deliberate. Three times this action of teaching is being stressed for us, and it's deliberate. Don't hide it, but teach it. But I want you to notice the second aspect of this practice of teaching there's not just deliberateness about it, but number two, there is direct involvement. From the dad. Direct involvement from the dad. Notice in verse 5. He's describing this practice of teaching. And it's deliberate. Don't hide but teach. Verse 5. He established a testimony in Jacob. And appointed a law in Israel. Which he commanded our fathers. Our fathers. The dad. To teach their children. My friend, if you're a man and you're married and you have a wife and you have children, God has laid upon you a great responsibility, dear friend. You are the spiritual head of your home. You are the head of your wife, Ephesians chapter 5. You're the spiritual head of the home. And if you now have made the decision to add children to that marriage, you are the spiritual head of those children. You are the spiritual head of that home. You are in the driver's seat of that home, spiritually speaking. Your home's spiritual well-being is a reflection of you and how well you are leading them. It is not by accident that Asaph says, I want the next generation and the next generation to know God's word. And if that's going to happen, then the father, the father has to be involved in the teaching. Now I realize that mothers, based on the unique role that God's given them, oftentimes have more of a time with the children, more opportunity to teach the children. But my friend, you as the man, as the husband, as the dad, you're the spiritual head of the home. You're going to make sure that's taking place. You're going to have an active part of that teaching process. You're not doing it all, but you're the spiritual head, and you're making sure it's being done and done God's way. When you think about the Lord's church, and you see the state of so many congregations, 
In many ways, it's due in part to the fact that there are men who are not leading their homes. In the congregation where I once preached, there were several ladies in the church who were not very faithful. They just weren't very faithful. Yet they came from homes that were very faithful. They were what we would consider faithful, active members of the Lord's church. Yet these ladies, though good, sweet ladies, were not very faithful themselves. And one day I sat and I thought about each of those situations, and every one of those situations had a common denominator, and it was the husband. The husband. The husband either was a non-Christian, they had married a non-Christian, or they had married a man who was not a faithful Christian. My friends, that's not by accident. How can a father make sure he's the spiritual head of his home? How can a father make sure that he's involved in this deliberate practice of teaching? If you've ever heard Glenn Colley talk about the family and the home, then perhaps you've heard him talk about what he calls the daddy list. The daddy list. It's where the dad sits down, whether it's on his phone through notes or whether it's through a Microsoft Word document or whatever it may be in a journal somewhere. He sits down and he makes a list of things he wants his children to know. Before they leave the home, before those 18 years are up, we might say, and he's out of the home, what do I want my child to know? And that list just grows and grows. It's the daddy list. And then the daddy sits down with the children and makes sure through teaching, through what's going on, that those children know those things, understand those things. <clears throat> One of the things that we do with Morgan at home is we have what's called Morgan's Tree of Knowledge. And Caitlin has gotten this poster board, and she on this poster board has drawn a tree. And on the tree, each leaf on that tree stands for some Bible fact or, or some aspect of what we might consider a daddy list. And it's questions like this. Morgan, who built the church? The answer is Jesus. Morgan, how many churches did Jesus build? Just one. Morgan, what is marriage? Marriage is one man and one woman. Morgan, how long is marriage to be? For life. Morgan, how many books of the Bible are there? There's 66. Morgan, how many Old Testament books? 39. Morgan, how many New Testament books? 27. Morgan, how many acts of worship are there? Five. What are those five acts of worship, Morgan? Sing, pray, teach the word, take the Lord's Supper, give of your means. Five acts of worship. Morgan, what does the word baptism mean? Immersion. You see the picture. Why is it important to know those things? Because, my friends, there are many grown individuals who don't know those things. Because if we want our children to grow up and be convicted of what the Word of God says, we have to instill those things in them from a very early age. And the dad needs to be involved in that. That's what the Word of God teaches. It's deliberate teaching, and the dad's directly involved in that. In Ephesians chapter 6, 1 to 4, you recall as Paul wrote about the home and various components and aspects of the home, he told the children to obey their parents in the Lord, but he also told fathers, fathers, to not provoke their children to anger or wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Dad, how well are you doing that? Husbands, how well are you leading your home? Is your home what God wants it to be? Are your children on that path to know God's word? Do you have that daddy list going? 
Are you actively involved in teaching and training your children? Do you make sure your family's here for worship? That they're here for Bible class? That they're involved in, in the work of the Lord's church? How well are you leading as a spiritual head of your home? Notice then thirdly from this passage. Back in Psalm 78, we have preparation for teaching. I must give careful heed, careful attention to God's word myself. I also then must be deliberate about teaching my children this practice of teaching. And as a dad, I must be directly involved in this teaching. We must stop and think, well, why? Why is it that we need to take such careful note to teach God's word to our children. Why as a dad should that be such a great priority for me? Why as a husband should this be such a major concern in my life? Well, notice with me in verses 6 to 8 that I believe Asaph outlines the purpose of teaching. The purpose of teaching. And I believe Asaph gives us here at least three reasons why it is important for your home to be a classroom, that, that we actually are teaching our children these things. Notice, first of all, from verse 6, the first purpose of teaching is it imparts knowledge and understanding. It imparts knowledge and understanding. Notice the very first phrase in verse 6. Teach them their children, verse 5, why? That the next generation might know them. Know them. The children yet unborn. And arise and tell them to their children. And notice in this passage we have three generations under consideration. We have the present generation who's being called upon to hear God's word and obey God's word themselves. But they're also then being called upon to teach them to their children so that their children then can teach a third generation their children's children. So we have three generations of people here. And notice that whether or not that third generation knows God's word is based upon whether or not that first generation knows God's word and then beyond knowing it is teaching it. Teaching it. It's one thing to know the Bible yourself, to be a Bible-quoting, a Bible-believing people, a Bible-believing congregation. It's one thing to be that, but what about the next generation? And what about then their children? You see, if we want the Lord's church to survive... We have to be teaching our children and also others. That's the way the New Testament church progresses. That's the way it's built. That's the way Christianity advances through teaching. It's a taught religion, John 6, 45, Acts 2, and so forth and so on. And here we have not only the next generation, but then the third generation. How can we make sure that our children can grow up and one day stand firm in the faith. That they'll be the elders, the deacons, the preachers. That our churches will remain sound, both doctrinally and in good works. How can we make sure that happens? By taking the time to deliberately, not haphazardly, unintentionally, but deliberately, purposefully instill these things into our next generation. And then we're doing something with that. We're also hopefully safeguarding that next generation. That they will then arise and when they have children and then have grandchildren, it will just perpetuate. You may know God's word, that's great. You may believe the truth, that's wonderful. But dear friend, it can't stop with you. It can't. Those sound beliefs, those faithful teachings, that life of good works, it can't die with you. It has to live on. And the way it lives on is by deliberately, purposely teaching the next generation. I think about these great gospel preachers who know God's word and all the good things they've done for God's cause. 
I think about these individuals in Ward's Church who, who are great Bible class teachers. They study God's Word. They understand many things about the Bible. They, they have great knowledge and understanding. They've done many great things for God's cause. But are we perpetuating that? Are we making sure that lives on through our sons and our daughters, our grandsons and our granddaughters? You know, I think what happens sometimes is, especially those who, as we say, grew up in the church. That is, we had parents who were Christians. And we're Christians, too. We were not, in essence, converted from a denomination at some point in our life. I think sometimes, if we're not careful, we can get very, excuse me, lazy, can't we? Lazy. We can become very comfortable. We've arrived, you know, I, I know this. Uh, I've been baptized for the mission of my sins. I know there's only one church. I, I've arrived. And we forget about perpetuating that to the next generation. So there's a first purpose for teaching. It's to impart knowledge and understanding. If the next generation is to know, and that next generation is to know, well, it starts with me knowing and also teaching. Notice also in verse 7 that there is a second purpose for teaching your children. And it's not just to impart knowledge and understanding, but number two, it is to create a personal faith. To create a personal faith. Notice verse 7. Tell your children, verse 5, they may know them, verse 6, and verse 7, they should set their hope in God. Their hope in God. Ace of saying, brethren, you need to teach your children these things so that when they grow up, they know these things. And beyond knowing that they can live their life with a personal faith and a genuine relationship with God. Christianity is a taught religion, but it's not just a religion of knowing facts. It's more than that. It's deeper than that. It's not just a religion of knowing a checklist of facts. And so, yes, we're imparting facts, imparting knowledge, understanding, beliefs, and conviction. But the goal is that as they grow, as they mature, they will take those facts, take that knowledge, take that understanding, and have a personal faith. Not a hand-me-down religion, we might say. You know, we step back and we think about the denominational world, and we condemn this, don't we? Well, you know, why are you what you are religiously? Well, because my grandparents and my, my great-grandparents. I preached in Mississippi while I was in preaching school, and there was a, a large denominational influence there. And we converted during those two years of preaching school an individual from the denomination who was literally just steeped in that denomination. His grandparents built the church. His, his parents were involved in it. He had cousins and brothers and sisters involved in it. His whole family was steeped in it. And oftentimes that's why people are what they are and believe what they believe because mama and daddy believed it. Grandmama and granddaddy believed it. My brothers and sisters believe it. And thus they believe it. It's just a hand-me-down religion. And we condemn that, don't we? Yet we, we come back to home base and we look around and we see individuals who are coasting along on their parents' religion. They're coasting along on their parents' and grandparents' beliefs. They themselves don't believe that. They themselves don't think like that. They themselves don't have a personal faith, a genuine personal relationship with God. It's just based on their parents and grandparents. But the point is, if we use our home as a classroom and we are hopefully helping to cultivate and grow that, we're safeguarding against that. We're not just passing on a religion. We're giving them God's word, teaching them the scriptures, instilling God's word in their mind. So the hope is that they'll set their hope in God, verse 7. Set their hope in God. Then we see number 3 from verse 8. And the end of verse 7, 
that there is a third purpose for teaching, not just to impart knowledge, understanding, not just to help cultivate and create a personal faith, but number three, it discourages rebellion and disobedience. Notice verse 7, the latter part of verse 7, and also verse 8, that they should set their hope in God and, and do what? And not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. That they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. Notice in those two verses the number of times, the number of ways Asaph is describing faithfulness to God in contrast to a life of disobedience and rebellion to God. He says to set your hope in God, Negatively, not forget God's works. Positively, keep God's commandments. Negatively, not be stubborn, not be rebellious. Not be like that past generation who was not steadfast, who was not faithful. He's telling them, by you teaching your children these things, they not only know, they not only have, but they will do. They will live a life of loyalty and obedience to God's will unlike that past generation. It discourages disobedience, discourages lawlessness. Where do you think people learn respect for God? In the home, I swear. Where do you think people learn respect for law enforcement? In the home. Where do you think they learn respect for teachers and principals? In the home. That's where it all begins. And part of that teaching, that training process is teaching about obedience. Teaching about discipline and consequences. Teaching about disobedience. And all of that coupled together with teaching God's word helps them to be unlike disobedience of the past and live a life of obedience to God. We think about Psalm 78, what a great challenge that is for us. And I ask you again, is your home a classroom? Is your home a classroom? What a great responsibility we have towards our children and our grandchildren, brethren. But it does not end with us providing physical needs or recreational needs or secular needs. But as arrows to send them back the Father in heaven. Thank you.